Okay, we are recording. Uh, welcome everybody. We are here now in, in a new talk uh, between Eclipsium Incorporated and Hama. Uh, this this time, uh, um, Jesse and, and Mikey will will talk about a good hole, a, vul a vulnerability that they found in uh, 2020. And uh, I think that, that it's going on this day. So, so it's uh, for, for us a real pleasure to, to have them here. The, the people that did the boot hole that is here. So uh, uh, welcome, thank you. And uh, you, are, you are here. Um, I can see that, that Daniel uh, is here also. So uh, let's start. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, having us. Uh, I think this will be uh, fun. So, uh, do you want to take this one or should I? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm Mickey. Um, I'm uh, I'm the person on the right, and I guess I I guess I do what Jesse does, but less effective. <laughs> and I'm gonna let Jesse take it. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm Jesse. I'm 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 the one on the on the left there, I guess. Uh, so that's that's what you that's what we look like. So we can uh, one day out, so. one day you see us in the street, you can say hey you, and that's it. So I I, I have been to Echo Party. So if you if you see me there, you might uh, you might recognize me. Uh, I'd like to come back. So uh, uh, maybe you can uh, see me there as well. Uh, we we do both work for uh, Eclipsium. We're principal researchers. We're essentially working for a, a relatively small startup that focuses on a. Uh, uh, device security and uh, low-level uh, components like this. So pre-boot firmware, other types of firmware, hardware configuration, that type of thing. And uh, we, we found this as uh, part of our work here. So it's kind of a, an interesting uh, project for us. So to, to really understand uh, why this is an issue, we, we should talk about kind of the history of attacks in this space. So. Uh, in general, there's been a long history of attacks against the boot process. And uh, essentially, things that lo load earlier have more privilege. So um, there have been things like boot sector viruses. Essentially, the earlier that you load, if you, if you have code that's running before the operating system or before something else, that code can actually uh, patch the operating system as it's being loaded or modify that process as it's as it's happening. So there's a lot of really interesting things that you can do if you can get code that runs as part of the bootloader or before the bootloader or before the operating system where you might have all these great protections in the operating system itself, but if you have malicious code that runs before the operating system itself loads, that, that malicious code can actually turn off some of these protections install backdoors, and do some other really interesting things. So that's why we've had things like boot sector viruses, uh, OS rootkits and bootkits. We've had ransomware that shows up even before uh, Windows loads. And then uh, like uh, boot sector wipers, where there's uh, essentially code that runs before the operating system and uh, wipes the system or does uh, other attacks. There was a pretty interesting uh, uh, Petya, not Petya, family of malware even recently, I think 2017 is when we saw some of those where there was a not Petya uh, that it infected the master boot record of legacy systems and it pretended to be ransomware, but it actually was a wiper. And this was used for some interesting attacks even just a, a few years ago. Uh, back in the old day with legacy boot, with the master boot record, volume boot record and those, there wasn't any security in that process. So the most you had was a checksum, which was you could just recalculate that if you were an attacker. But there wasn't anything as far as like cryptographic signature verification or any real thought to how to, uh, how to harden the boot process against this type of attack. Um, one, of the, one of the goals of why we moved away from legacy boot and started using UEFI is to have the ability to have some thought to security in this space. And uh, uh, Secure Boot was in introduced and uh, included in the UEFI uh, 2.0 specification. So it's been around for a while. Um, I think 2000, 
2009 or so was when that 2.0 specification came out, even though there were some previous uh, proposed ways to do the, that before then. But es essentially, back in the old days, there wasn't any security. And with UEFI, we're standardizing on a new, a new way to do the boot process that we started including security features and thinking about how to actually protect that, uh, that boot process. So one of the, the key things that uh, UEFI Secure Boot does is uh, cryptographic signature verification. And uh, in order to have that initial first key that you start measuring everything based on or verifying everything based on, uh, those keys are actually stored in the, the spy flash on the motherboard where you have a, a platform key that's persistent, uh, that's provisioned by the manufacturer. You'll also have a key exchange key that's also provisioned by the manufacturer, and then some initial uh, DB and DBX uh, databases, which all of these are stored in uh, uh, NVRAM variables within the uh, NVRAM region in the spy flash that's a physical chip on the, on the motherboard. It's usually a SOIC 8 or SOIC 16, but uh, it contains those keys. It also contains the, uh, the boot firmware that's going to, to run when the system powers on and it starts executing code at the architectural reset vector. But there's this key hierarchy with a platform key that then signs updates to the key exchange key. So if you want to update the key exchange key or update the DB or DBX, those need to be signed by the key that controls it. So uh, th those are protected in some sense with this key hierarchy. Um, you also will have some things that you're loading off of disk or uh, other storage, like the, uh, the bootloader, which is going to be signed by Microsoft. Or uh, in the case of uh, Linux, Microsoft is unwilling to sign Grub because of license issues. So instead, there was uh, this other thing that was added in that's called a shim, which is essentially the entire purpose of the shim is to be uh, signed by Microsoft's key so that it can be verified as part of the boot process. And then the shim contains a certificate that is then used to verify Grub, which is signed by the distro. So there's a little bit of a complication there for Linux because of licensing and how the, uh, the UEFI secure boot ecosystem has uh, kind of uh, solidified around Microsoft being one of these trust anchors that Microsoft's public key is provisioned into all the systems that is uh, distributed by uh, manufacturers like Dell, Lenovo, and HP, and others. So once we have these keys, these keys are used essentially to verify the next step in the chain. So uh, the, the UEFI firmware, when that starts executing, uh, at some point, it will start verifying the next Dixie module. So there's a, a Dixie is the driver execution environment. There's a, a few different types of uh, uh, applications inside UEFI firmware, like drivers, option ROMs, applications, bootloaders. All of these are signed and verified using keys that are uh, uh, in the in the the DB or allow database. DBX is the uh, revocation database. Anything that's in a, a DB or DBX should not be, a, let's see, here, this is what I was uh, trying to get at. So uh, DBX is the, anything that is revoked needs to go into DBX. Uh, anything that is allowed uh, goes in a DB or is signed by something in DB. And uh, in, in DB, you'll generally have Microsoft's uh, UEFI third-party certificate authority cert. And then that's used to sign the vendor, vendor shim. And, that's also, and then the vendor shim contains the vendor cert, which is used to sign Grub. So the, the way that this got started in the first place is that um, back in uh, February of 2020, uh, Windows, Windows Update pushed out a update to that DBX revocation database. And it was deployed through Windows Update. And it caused a lot of unexpected problems where some systems were hanging in the update process. Some systems were failing to boot. Uh, it turns out that uh, the, uh, that revocation process uh, 
was not widely tested. And there's a lot of different uh, systems out there that it worked fine, but there were also a lot of systems that it didn't work. And this was all uh, because of there was a, uh, a vulnerable bootloader that was found in the Kaspersky rescue disk. And they had intended to uh, uh, disallow and revoke that uh, bootloader. So there were uh, five entries that were added to that DBX revocation list. But it caused uh, such widespread issues that they uh, pulled the update uh, less than a week later. And this was interesting to us because there's this is a, a process that's not widely tested. There hasn't been a lot of revocations like this. And it also kind of highlighted some of these issues like, oh, maybe we should go take a look at take a look at other bootloaders and see what else we can find. I mean we, we knew the we knew how the process is supposed to work. We've seen yeah. the specifications. We've seen the implementations in in, uh, in GitHub by the, the core EDK. But you know, you assume it works, but in real life it doesn't. Or in some cases where it fails in, in bricks systems. Yeah, I mean there there's a there's an interesting uh, problem with the the supply chain for UEFI BIOS itself because there's the UEFI forum, which creates the UEFI specification. And then Tiano Core uh, is an implementation that is intended to meet the UEFI specification. And that's the reference code implementation. Tiano Core is taken by uh, independent BIOS vendors like AMI, Phoenix, Inside. They add their own extra value add uh, special components on top of that. And then they sell their improved version of the BIOS to system manufacturers like Dell, Lenovo, uh, HP, all the others. So and then the, the system manufacturers add their own stuff on top of it. So there's a lot of opportunities for new things to uh, be added that have problems or things to go wrong or maybe a fix that went into Tiano Core didn't make it into the end version of the uh, BIOS that actually is shipped in customer devices. So there's some some interesting problems there and a lot of places that things can go wrong. So we, we thought this was interesting. And uh, Mickey started uh, taking a look at uh, at some different bootloaders. And uh, yeah, I looked at uh, I looked at Grub. <laughs> and the first thing I did was I, I looked at the source code and I started looking and it was just a huge tree of files and in in that tree I saw a little tiny branch of testing and how they did unit testing and I looked at the unit testing and thought to myself well there's not enough test cases here why I why not I'll just try one of the test cases that are not in the unit test and started like manually fuzzing. One of the th one of the things I hit was this screenshot that I uh, I sent back back when uh, I sent this to Jesse on Slack, and <laughs> this is exactly how I sent it. And if you look closely on the on, on the on the stack on the left, you'll see on the registry dump there, you see 41, 41, 41s, and that's where one of the things that it caught my eye when I did that. Also, like setting up the environment to fuzz a bootloader is not easy. So you got to virtualize the system, automate the process, make sure you copy files over, script it, and all that. Once that's done, you got a bug. Yeah. So kind of of note, we we found this. Uh, Mickey found this April second, and that's. Thursday, April second, sent this over. It's like, huh, this is this is pretty interesting. Uh, let's take a look. And then, oh, yeah, eight twenty four p.m. If you've noticed. Yeah, it, so it was even in the evening in uh, Thursday. So Mickey had sent this over. Uh, as as he pointed out, there's there's a lot of issues with since you're testing a bootloader, you don't have the operating system. You could do it with uh, hardware debugging capabilities. But that's a pain. So in this case, we'd set up a virtualization, virtualized environment using a Kimu. So he sent me the files over that he was using, and I, I did some experimentation with that. And uh, I also like went and did some other stuff over the weekend. So I didn't, I wasn't just focused on this 
uh, all weekend as well. But by Tuesday, just a few days later, we basically figured out what was going on, uh, found where the code is a uh, is a uh, crashing, what what's actually happening when we got that overflow, and we were able to confirm that we were able to get full arbitrary code execution, um, at this case. So it was relatively quick to uh, turn this into, hmm, this this looks interesting. This looks like it might be a bug into actually confirming full arbitrary code execution. So we talked about the, the signature checking that's happening, but there's a bit of a complication because uh, the configuration file for Grub itself changes pretty regularly. It has a lot of stuff in there that is not, that's expected to change. Like you'll have uh, like labels for file systems or different different menu options and stuff like that. So you can have like four different, if you've got like a, a Linux box Ubuntu, you might have three different versions of the kernel that are installed at once. So you can boot in the current version or the previous version, and you might have uh, labels for the file system to let it know where, where the root partition is and where to boot from. So there's a lot of stuff that changes in Grub config, and that, that file is not actually uh, signed because it changes so frequently. But the configuration file is a, uh, it's a complex domain specific language. So there are, there's a complex parser in there. And there's, there's a lot of problems that tend to happen when you have a, a complex language with, a, with a, a parser that's kind of custom designed for that specific, uh, for that specific application. So we, we basically ran into this buffer overflow when, when uh, Grub is parsing its configuration file. And if we take a closer look, um, so the, uh, the, the way that this works is that uh, flex, the, the way that the uh, Grub uh, parser is written is that it's using the, the flex uh, basically a flex uh, parser library where you you basically create a uh, domain specific language input file and it generates a lot of uh, helper code for you so some of this code that's generated by the flex code generator uh, in, in this is in the, this first code sample why why do before action and uh, it, it, it basically is calling a function that is defined in Grub. So there's, there's two different people who are creating code here. There's, there's the code that's generated automatically by Flex, and then there's a uh, helper function that, uh, that uh, Grub needed to provide. And uh, let's see. I don't have my updates. Uh, so if, if you take a closer look in the middle of the... Uh, of this uh, first code sample, there's a uh, YY fatal error. And uh, basically, there's, OK, right here in the middle, there's this uh, YY len is greater than YYL max. And in that case, the, the code that's generated by Flex uh, has detected that the, the input token that it's parsing is too large to fit in the buffer that they that they have for this token, so they call this fatal error macro. But the macro that was provided by uh, Grub uh, doesn't actually fatally exit. It just prints a fatal error message and then continues. So the the problem there is that we've detected that the uh, that the token is going to be too large for the buffer. We tried to call this fatal error function to actually exit, but it didn't actually exit. And uh, it, it returns and continues executing code past this YY fatal error uh, macro. And the, the thing that it does is immediately this uh, uh, stern copy of the input into a buffer that we already know is too small, which is a uh, uh, a, a classic uh, buffer overflow at this point. So when when the uh, when the the buffer is overflowed, we we basically end up overwriting all of the contents and controlling all of the contents of this 
of all the fields in this uh, lexer param uh, structure, including this record, recording, uh, record pause. Essentially, record is a flag to say, yes, I'm, I want to record what is happening and what is being parsed. Uh, recording is a pointer to a buffer that's been dynamically allocated to hold these records of what's, what's happened so far. And then uh, record pause is essentially the, the position into that buffer. It's essentially an index into the buffer that we point to with recording. And record len is the size of that buffer. So first, there's a little bit of a check to see uh, does the buffer have enough room for the string that we're about to copy into it? If it doesn't, it'll do a reallocation. And then afterwards, it'll copy the input string that's being parsed uh, into, into that buffer by adding the base, the pointer to the base of the buffer and then the index into the, the buffer as that destination pointer. So by because we control all these variables, we can uh, leverage that into what's called a write what where primitive. So uh, the input string that's going to be written is something that we control. We control that the pointer to the recording buffer and the recording pause. And by uh, splitting those up so that we uh, add those two variables into the destination that we want to write to, we control the destination address as well. Um, this can be leveraged to gain arbitrary, arbitrary code execution. Um, one thing that makes this a lot easier is that um, in the operating system and application space, we have uh, um, all kinds of exploit mitigation protections like sandboxes, address randomization, uh, DEP and or NX, the NX bit to basically make the stack uh, non-executable make the stack and heap non-executable. So th those exist in the address in the operating system and application space, but UEFI is lagging behind significantly. So in most cases, you have a fully executable hack, uh, stack and heap. You have uh, predictable addresses. Like within, within a particular system, things will load at the same addresses, which, which makes a uh, makes this type of exploit much, much easier. Um, so it, at, at this point, it's essentially go, like going back to the 90s and simple mode uh, buffer overflows. So the, the fix for this particular bug was, was really simple. It's just a single line change and updating the comment to say, actually print the fatal error and actually exit. So because just printing out fatal error doesn't actually stop it from processing. They needed to essentially call a different function, which did actually uh, stop processing uh, and not do that stir copy that was into the buffer that, was, that we already knew was too small. So at this point, we, we, we knew that there was a bug here. It was going to be hard to fix. So we reached out to, uh, to the uh, uh, Linux distros that we knew were affected, like uh, Canonical with Ubuntu, Red Hat, SUSE, Debian. And then we had some issues initially contacting the uh, upstream Grub maintainers because the only contact information that we had was a public mailing list. There wasn't any information about who specifically to talk to and how to uh, send them uh, send them an, an encrypted email. But we, we did talk to... Uh, uh, some people at Canonical, and they pointed us to uh, uh, Daniel Kipper, who is one of the primary uh, Grub maintainers, and was able to provide his public key, and we were able to basically start communicating with uh, them. And uh, we uh, initially sent that email. We, we uh, th there was a lot of problems with using PGP for uh, coordinating this type of uh, bug because it involved a lot of people. So we did move over to using Keybase as a, a communication channel. And that also allowed us to easily fi uh, share files. We had like an encrypted Git that was also uh, hosted in Keybase and allowed us to uh, make changes, test pass patches, and have that distributed to all the different uh, participants a lot easier. And, and although we initially found just this, this first issue, there was a, a very simple bug, 
it's it's going to be a hard fix because there's a lot of things like the DBX updates that need to go out. There's a lot of people uh, affected that we uh, found. So all the major Linux distributions were were found. We also found uh, a number of uh, network appliance vendors like Cisco and Juniper were also affected by this. Uh, so we, we ended up uh, having a large coordination effort. There were uh, 18 different companies involved. We had uh, BIOS vendors like uh, AMI was involved, UEFI security response team. Microsoft was uh, pulled in and helping us uh, coordinate this as well. Microsoft is the one who's going to have to sign all the shims for uh, for all the fixes that go out. So there were around 100 people total uh, just involved in the Keybase channel. And then at all the different various companies, there were even more people involved. Um, so because it was such a large, painful effort, we also wanted to go uh, find more and fix more while we could. So there was a grub fixes that were done, and then some shim signing changes that were made because of some of the some of the issues that we'll talk about in a second about the the DBX update and the the shim made things a lot more difficult. So um, <clears throat> there, there was a, a lot a, a large effort here. It, it it turned out it turned out that we had eight total uh, CVEs that were assigned for different different problems that were found and a uh, patch set of uh, 28, uh, 28 fixes that uh, that uh, were uh, made public and made pushed upstream and integrated into all these different uh, distributions. Uh, we also had 169 new hashes and three new certificates that went into that revocation database. And there's some uh, that's. There, there's some problems there just because that DBX revocation database has a, a limited amount of space to uh, actually store new entries. So it's uh, we're, we're essentially, if we have a few more uh, issues like this or uh, fixes that need to go out, we could pretty easily run out of space for entries in the revocation database. So. Some of the things that we did was uh, uh, there was a, a grub code, code audit involving multiple different uh, organizations, um, a lot of work by uh, Canonical. Uh, uh, VMware was involved also. Um, uh, some people from uh, Oracle helped uh, host this. Some, uh, a number of the uh, grub maintainers uh, work at Oracle, so they also helped uh, coordinate this. But then there also were issues with the shimmerification and making sure that it actually worked and doing large DBX updates on real hardware. And then there's also issues with just getting all the updates ready. Uh, as an example, uh, uh, Canonical had four different versions of Ubuntu that were all still uh, in service or providing updates. So they needed to have uh, updates for all four of those different versions of Ubuntu. Uh, they had to backport patches to Grub for a lot of these uh, a lot of these older uh, versions of uh, Ubuntu, and just getting all those updates tested and signed, and we we still had uh, issues and uh, still had uh, problems once these uh, updates actually went out into uh, into into the real world. It's been there for a while. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it was a it was an interesting. Uh, Interesting problem. So there's a, there's a lot of work going going uh, on ahead of time before this uh, before this uh, uh, disclosure went public. So in, as part of that large code audit effort, there was a number of additional vulnerabilities that were found. Uh, these are ones that are specifically believed to be exploitable, um, and th those were actually assigned uh, specific CVEs. Uh, there, were, there were a lot of additional issues that were identified, but not fully uh, root cause to determine if they were uh, exploitable or not. Uh, we could take a, a closer look at some of the types of things that were found. One of the things that was really persistent throughout the entire Grub code base is this type of operation, where you're, you're doing some kind of uh, arithmetic operation 
like uh, multiplication or multiplication and addition and using the result of that for a uh, allocation operation without checking to see if there was any kind of arithmetic overflow. So there was a lot of places that this type of thing had to be uh, fixed. And they also uh, pulled in some uh, safe math primitives that are available in uh, uh, newer versions of GCC, but some of the older distributions that we still wanted to support didn't have those new primitives in GCC. So those had to be essentially ported to the old uh, versions of Linux that they wanted to uh, uh, switch over to use. So this was a very pervasive change throughout the Grub code bases, uh, changing all these, uh, these type of allocations based on uh, arithmetic operations into using helper functions that would then go do the uh, arithmetic operation and check for uh, overflows at all the different steps before it actually went, got to the uh, allocation point. Uh, there were a number of uh, additional integer overflows found a bunch of places. Uh, this is a, an example where their integer overflow or potential for an integer overflow that's used in variables and then also other ones that are used as, as part of allocation. So there's a, a number of examples of places where they uh, did some allocation and then uh, stored it as a variable, used it for some other purpose that uh, could potentially be exploited. So th there also is a pretty interesting case where um, I, I, I mentioned that the, the Grub configuration file is a, is a pretty complex domain-specific language. It includes the ability to have functions and, and other stuff in this language. Um, but it turns out that you could define a function and then inside of that function define another function with the same name. And the way that was implemented in the parser would result in a use after free where you could actually uh, kind of uh, create a special uh, flow in the, the scripting language to do that, define a function with the same name inside of a function that's currently executing in order to uh, uh, trigger this use after free and uh, get code execution that way. Um, it, it is a, a complex language, so you have a lot of uh, ability to uh, uh, manipulate some interesting things in uh, in the language itself because it's a uh, there's a lot of op opportunity there. Um, there. There was an interesting uh, overflow in in it RD size handling where when when uh, when Grub is running, uh, you you can give the the kernel a lot of different. Um, uh, command line arguments for for the initRD and it's when it parses all of those arguments it will uh, basically add all the sizes together and you could have a long uh, command line that has a lot of really large files and create uh, an integer overflow uh, as well so there, there's a lot of interesting things that are classically considered unsafe uh, C operations that were found just pervasively throughout the source code. I wonder how many of those are the classic part began <laughs> years after the code was written. <laughs> like Pro probably a lot, but I, I I think a lot of them were probably there for a long time as well because uh, this this particular overflow that we we initially found um, that has been there since the code was initially created in two thousand nine. So. The, this, that vulnerability was was lurking in the code base since before Secure Boot was widely available. So essentially, every signed version of Grub was vulnerable to this. So th that's that's why there were so many uh, versions of Grub and so many shims that needed to be uh, revoked. Um, there, there was another interesting uh, vulnerability that was found that um, uh, the the Grub. So there, there's a uh, mainline grub, and then the, the distros typically have their own patches that sit on top of the, uh, the grub from upstream. And this is a, a bug that was found in the patch set that uh, the, the distros were applying, but it wasn't in the mainline grub. So it was kind of an interesting scenario. Uh, this was a case where 
if if you use UEFI Secure Boot to directly boot Grub without using the shim, um, Grub would not actually do any verification of the kernel that was being loaded, it would load unsigned kernels because it depended on some functionality that's in the shim to actually do that verification. This was a really simple fix. It literally was just changing that uh, less than zero to less than or equal zero because the case where the return code is zero was actually really important because uh, this the return code from this function that they were calling was it was one if the signature verify was successful and it was negative one if the signature verify fi failed for some reason but th this function actually returned zero if if it's unable to do the signature verification at all because the shim is not present because it depends on that that code in the shim itself to do that verification which is kind of a, an interesting uh uh complication of the dependencies there that they didn't realize uh, uh happened which uh, i i thought this was a, a pretty interesting uh bug there so as as part of that uh that uh security audit there were a lot of other things that were found that are probably vulnerabilities. Uh, lots of lots of uh, bad code practices, uh, multiple instances of double free, a number of other instances of use after free. Uh, there were a lot of memory leaks that were fixed, a bunch of other uh, integer overflows uh, that were found. But uh, th those vast number of other issues that were identified weren't uh, specifically root cause to see if they were reachable and exploitable. It's just like, we, we know these ones are, we know these ones are likely exploitable. We'll assign CVEs to these. There's all these other risky, dangerous things we found as well. Let's fix those also, even if we're not assigning C individual CVEs for those. So there were also a couple other vulnerabilities that were uh, not directly grub vulnerabilities, but there were vulnerabilities in the Linux kernel itself where one of the uh, one of the goals of this uh, revocation process was to, uh, because we're evoking all these previous shims, all these previous grubs, and we know that there are some, there are a couple uh, Linux kernel bugs that also uh, could be used to bypass secure boot restrictions or lockdown. Let's make sure that any versions of grub uh, that will be loadable by the shims that we're signing with these these new keys or new certs from uh, uh, Microsoft, new signatures from Microsoft, that those will not be able to be used to or be able to load the older vulnerable Linux kernel. So uh, the process of uh, doing the shim review and uh, making sure that uh, the fixes, the proper fixes were going in to all the, the grub Current the 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 grub uh, shims and and or the the distro grub and shim. Uh, one of the steps there was making sure that uh, it wouldn't be able to load older versions of the kernel as well. So there was uh, some things like uh, rotating the kernel uh, key and certificate uh, that's used for secure boot as well. Because when when the system is booting up, uh, the firmware uh, verifies uh, the shim. Uh, shim verifies grub, and then grub verifies the kernel as part of that a boot chain. So we, we figured while we're at it, we, well, let's let's make sure that these uh, uh, Linux secure boot bypasses are uh, are not present as well. So there there was a interesting uh, complication for uh, for this whole process because uh, I, I mentioned there was a, a a limited amount of space for the uh, the DBX uh, uh, DBX revocation database. Um, essentially, if any time you want to add a new entry to the the DBX ad address or the the DBX uh, revocation database, every time you need a new shim, you need to revoke the old shim. Generally, in most cases, vendors needed new shims. They needed to revoke uh, the old shim. Um, a canonical and also Debian were trying a, a new mechanism where uh, 
instead of uh, instead of directly signing Grub with the certificate that's embedded in in the shim, like most vendors, they in, instead embedded a, a, a CA cert or certificate authority cert in the shim, and then they had an additional intermediate cert, and that intermediate cert is used to sign Grub. So essentially, they had an extra step in the uh, signature certificate chain there. So uh, Ubuntu and Debian were able to revoke just a specific certificate instead of revoking the entire shim by hash. They were able to keep their shim, just revoke that individual cert certificate, generate a new certificate with their CA, and use that to sign uh, the new non-vulnerable grub going forward. But most vendors needed to uh, have a new shim, uh, have a new cert, and all of those other new vendors needed to be added to the uh, their shim added to the dbx which was why there was 156 shims added to that uh, dbx database uh, one complication with uh, ubuntu's new process that they were using is that the functionality to do this was largely untested they hadn't really done this operation before so they were they were a little concerned that it wasn't actually going to work and there was a lot of testing to actually uh, try that out so they're all, one of the other parts of that uh, uh, new process of new of getting new shims for everybody was to uh, try and uh, get other vendors to uh, or other distributions to uh, move to this other new architecture on the right, where they were using a separate CA and having an intermediate cert instead, so that that would help uh, reduce the number of shims that they'd have to uh, revoke. Uh, for a future uh, revocation event. So we already knew that there was going to be uh, new issues coming out. So in uh, March of 2021, uh, a new set of uh, CVEs came out. And uh, even back before our first disclosure, we were already getting reports of uh, uh, new CVEs, uh, including uh, a, a couple even before our initial uh, disclosure date of July 29th, uh, 2020. So we, we knew that there was going to be another uh, uh, set of updates uh, only a few months later. And there, there were uh, eight in this uh, set as well. Um, the, the, first, the first batch of patches was a 28 patch uh, series. Uh, this, this new set was 117 patches that went out to the mailing list. And there was a lot of stuff that was fixed there. Uh, beyond that, uh, that list of uh, eight, uh, eight uh, named CVEs, uh, they they did also add some uh, initial uh, uh, initial implementations of some new, new some new things that are uh, that are uh, being proposed to uh, improve Grub and harden Grub a little bit. So uh, one of the things that was added was what's called a secure boot advanced targeting which uh, instead of individually revoking each file by, by certificate or by hash, uh, they can say this particular generation of Grub revoke all of those versions for, so Grub would have a, uh, uh, some metadata included in the, uh, in the executable itself that would say, I'm, I'm compliant to this generation of, uh, of Grub, and then they can uh, revoke things a little bit more easily, uh, the just the just the first uh, version or just the first uh, uh, batch of revocations for these uh, boot hole issues used up about a third of the total um, space for that revocation list that's in a typical system. So it's a uh, we're we're running out of space. So we're we're trying to come up with ways to uh, reduce uh, future revocation issues. Um. So let's kind of get back to more of a high level view of uh, this type of attack scenario. Um, th this is not something that you that would be a, a first, uh, like an initial toehold into the environment. This is something where it's essentially a privilege escalation attack, where maybe you have uh, malware running on the system. And if you have the privileges to modify the bootloader, which generally requires uh, admin, uh, in most cases, uh, 
Uh, there, there are some cases where you can have like a pixie boot scenario or some kind of network boot scenario where someone else could modify something in the system and, and be able to modify the bootloader. But in most cases, this does require admin, but that's still admin as the user with inside the operating system. And by doing this attack, you're able to escalate privilege to essentially get arbitrary code execution during the boot process at a point that you are more privileged than the operating system itself. So it's essentially an attack where you're, you're, you're coming in with privileges inside the operating system and constrained by the operating system, but you can do a privilege escalation attack to get code execution before the operating system even loads. You can then modify the operating system as, as it loads and install backdoors and compromise other security protections within the operating system itself. Um, a lot of people think that this is something that is uh, only relevant for Linux systems since you're, it's a Grub bug and Linux generally uses Grub. Um, there are some other environments, like so, there are some FreeBSD environments or BSD-based uh, network appliances that use Grub. One thing a lot of people don't realize is that uh, Grub and the Shim are signed by Microsoft, and the Microsoft third-party UEFI certificate authority is used as the root of trust for most uh, consumer PCs, whether it's a client, like a laptop or a desktop, or it's a server. Those all use Microsoft's third-party CA as their root of trust. So even if you're on a Windows system, if someone gets a malware execution, they could switch the existing bootloader from the Windows bootloader to a vulnerable version of Grub, exploit this, and then chain load Windows in order to boot into the, uh, into the uh, Windows operating system. So it looks like the system is normal, even though You've also done, you've actually done some uh, malicious things uh, at that point. So there's a interesting uh, complication there that this actually applies to a lot of systems that don't necessarily have Grub on them because they trust this key that is is being used to sign Grub. So essentially, the majority of Windows and Linux devices which have secure boot are affected by this, which means uh, servers, workstations, like corporate devices, enterprise devices, your your laptop at home, if it has UEFI secure boot, is almost certainly uh, vulnerable to this. Um, one thing that was also interesting is we found uh, network appliances like Cisco, NetApp, Juniper, they were also using uh, Grub with uh, secure boot in order to uh, in order to uh, secure the the uh, the chain of trust for their their platform plat for their uh, platforms as well. Um, the, their their scenario was a little bit interesting because they're outside of the PC architect or the the PC ecosystem, so they're not using Microsoft's uh, key as the root of trust. They're using their own key, but they're still vulnerable to this because they're still parsing that external Grub configuration file. So they needed to do their own. Uh, revocation and update process as well. So th there are a lot of interesting uh, special purposes devices uh, like ATMs, uh, point of sale industrial workstations, uh, some uh, uh, OT or IoT, uh, industrial IoT devices are also uh, running Linux with Grub using Secure Boot, which was an interesting thing to run into. Uh, we also ran into some issues in uh, cloud instances where some of the clouds uh, use UEFI Secure Boot as part of a, uh, hardening their uh, uh, security boot process. Uh, one thing that was really interesting is that right, right before the disclosure happened, we, we discovered that uh, Google Cloud had some issues with deploying the, uh, the updates because some of their uh, secure VMs uh, were using secure boot, uh, 
but they they were essentially were using uh, Kimu in order to uh, virtualize uh, the the VM inside the cloud instance. But the uh, the options uh, there, there's a couple different uh, uh, options you can provide to Kimu to uh, say that the NVRAM format uh, is a certain size, and Google Cloud was using the the small NVRAM format, so they didn't even have enough room in their cloud instances to deploy the DBX update that was required for this uh, for this revocation and, and this incident. So, the, and it, it wasn't something that you could just uh, reboot the VM with a different uh, Kimu flag. You needed to actually modify the the two different uh, NVRAM formats were not compatible, so they they actually needed to migrate from one NVRAM format to the new NVRAM format, which was a uh, uh, kind of a, a bad thing to run into only a few days before the uh, the disclosure goes out and the uh, the updates were uh, going out. So for for mitigating this, there's a there's some complications where, unlike a normal vulnerability where you just update the package and you're done, um, there, there are scenarios where, because of the attack scenario, the the attacker could just bring the old version of the old vulnerable, the old vulnerable version of Grub, install that on the system, and then exploit this. So you need to actually make sure that the old version is not loadable, which is why you need to replace all the shims. You need to revoke all the previous shims to make sure that you can't actually load the, the previous vulnerable version. So you needed the, the updates to Grub uh, from the, the Grub distributors. All the Linux distributor distributions need to uh, uh, take those updates uh, from Grub upstream, integrate that into their distribution, including backporting fixes for older versions and older distributions they want to support. And then all those new shims in all those distributions need to be signed by the Microsoft third-party UEFI certificate authority. Uh, one problem here also is that uh, even if we had wanted to, we couldn't have uh, rotated and updated the UEFI uh, certificate authority because there's a lot of hardware that depends on that, like uh, PCI option ROMs. Uh, are going to be signed by that Microsoft third-party UEFI CA and other stuff that just made it impossible to actually have an easy path to just rotate that key, sign everything. We had to explicitly go revoke all those previous shims. So th the other thing is that you need to actually update all the bootloaders, make sure that all your installation media uh, is updated before you deploy that revocation list. So in order to actually prevent the old vulnerable versions from being used in a, this type of attack, you need to actually update the DBX revocation list and uh, deploy that and write that to the NVRAM region in that spy chip on the motherboard. And uh, if you do that in the wrong order, things can go wrong. So um, some other things we ran into is, uh, even though there was such a large effort of like testing, uh, multiple versions of the patches were, were created. There were, there were some uh, bugs that slipped through, and we had some regressions after, after updates went out. So there was a different previous bug where uh, certain systems that were using, they, they weren't even using UEFI boot. They were using uh, BIOS uh, legacy boot, where you have the master boot record, and the master boot record is then loading the next stage where this other bug had, re had resulted where it recorded where the master boot record was in the wrong place. So when the boot hole updates went out, the wrong MBR got updated, and then there was a mismatch between the MBR that the system was actually booting, on, booting from and the, the second stage that was being loaded by the code in the MBR. And that affected both uh, uh, physical hardware, uh, physical servers, and also some uh, cloud instances that were using uh, uh, UEF or uh, using uh, the legacy uh, BIOS boot with the master boot record. Uh, there also was a, a null pointer to reference where uh, if you were dual booting between Linux and Windows, 
it meant that you actually couldn't chain load Windows from Grub. And that was uh, fixed pretty quickly, but it was still uh, kind of a oops. Uh, I guess nobody had actually tested that in the uh, the, the the many different uh, uh, tests that were done before before these updates went out. And then uh, uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux and CentOS use a uh, a different shim or a significantly different shim than almost all the other Linux distributions. So there was a there was a bug that was. Uh, Red Hat and CentOS specific that uh, cause systems to uh, panic and not boot. So uh, there, there were some uh, bumps in uh, get, getting these updates out. And then there's also just issues of the, the revocation process has a history of making devices uh, unbootable. So uh, there, there was uh, some concerns about making sure that people would uh, uh, update things in, in the right order. So making sure that your your system is uh, 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 has the has the bootloader and shim updated, and then you update the revocation list. And if you have a dual boot setup where maybe you have Linux and Windows or multiple versions of Linux on the same bit system, uh, you might need to handle that specially. Um, but essentially, the big point is just just you need to update the code that's going to be loaded and signed by the new cert before you revoke the old one. And you can also, like in an, in an enterprise environment, you can run into a, a disaster recovery processes where you might have like a gold C CD or gold image that you boot systems from. And that's been specifically created for that organization. So you need to make sure that that recovery media boots on uh, new systems, uh, systems that the DBX update has been applied to. Uh, or if you have like failing hardware and need to do a, a swap of a device, you might get a new system that has a DBX update already on it that is going to fail when you try when you attempt to boot what's the the non-updated uh, bootloader that's on your your disk that you're swapping us out. So there's some there's some complications there with uh, enterprise deployments where um, you generally want to test test the the deployment the, the DBX update on each type of system that you're a uh, that you're uh, pushing it out to before you uh, push it out to everyone. Um, so th there is a uh, Microsoft and uh, UEFI.org has this set of DBX updates that, are, that can be applied. These are not being pushed out through Microsoft Update. Um, Canonical has started uh, updating DBX uh, automatically. Uh, so they, they've had a uh, pretty good luck with uh, updating DBX through Canonical. But generally, you do want to test that on a uh, if you have a lot of some particular device, you should uh, test that and make sure that it's uh, working with each different type of device before you push it out. If you push it out and there's a problem with a thousand uh, servers in a in a data center, you're going to have a really bad day. If it's just an individual person uh, with their the laptop, it's generally a lot easier because you can just you already have the system in front of you. You can go into BIOS, disable secure boot, uh, and then boot up the system do those updates, then go back in and re-enable secure boot. So it's relatively easy if it's an individual person, but if you're dealing with like managing a fleet of devices in an enterprise environment, it's a, it's a lot uh, more painful. Um, so there, there is uh, some, some basic recommendations. We did have some PowerShell and bash scripts to uh, look for bootloaders that were available. It's generally just, you, you should be aware that you might have something funny in your, in your uh, EFI system partition. Uh, take a look there. You can essentially the EFI system partition is uh, mounted by default in uh, in Linux. Uh, in Windows, you can mount it with a uh, slash s flag and look at the contents there. I, I generally think it's a good idea for people to uh, look there anyway, so that they understand uh, where these files are coming from and what what what's actually there in the uh, EFI system partition. Um, we do have uh, links to a lot of different. Uh, uh, advisories and uh, additional information about this. The uh, updated revocation list is essentially at uh, uh, uefi.org slash uh, uh, revocation list file, I believe. Um, there have been a, a bunch of uh, bugs that were filed as well about this type of issue. That, that link at the bottom was about uh, basically uh, incidents in uh, Google Cloud that systems were failing to boot because of uh, some issues with uh, 
with the updates the day that it went out, but that got uh, resolved relatively quickly. Uh, we do have some additional uh, links, like there's our GitHub. Our uh, initial uh, uh, report is uh, is at that top link, and we also were collecting a, a list of advisories uh, at that other spot. So, and that's it. Do you, do you have any uh, other stuff I missed, Becky? No, I think you covered everything and beyond. <laughs> so now we uh, we can open it up for questions. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, I am astonished. Uh, such an old code base that, that was there hanging around for, for vulnerabilities. It's a massive job that, that you do. It's, uh, it's very, very nice. Very, I didn't know about that. <laughs> hey, I, I, it's, this, is a, this is a group effort. You know, it's, a, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting problem because there is, there's, there is, like you, you tend to think of the boot process as relatively simple. It's just, I need, I need to uh, load the kernel, like look in a file system, find something, boot, boot it, and start it. But there's support for tons of different types of hardware and tons of different types of uh, file systems. So there, there's a really rich set of modules that you can have where you can have like BSD file systems, Linux file systems, Windows file systems. <clears throat> and all of these are, are complex code. And, one thing that was really interesting when we first ran into this and started talking to the, the Grub maintainers is, is that I think there was four four people who were part-time part -time <laughs> maintaining Grub. So it's like it's this foundational technology that everybody depends on. And we don't even have people who are focused full time on this. It's not a big team working on it. Yeah. And it's it was a little bit terrifying to realize that that was the situation we were in. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. It was a, a really hot spot that, that nobody noticed before. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 there's this there's this mindset that open source means that everybody looks at it like lar many eyes makes bugs shallow, essentially. No. But there's this <laughs> there's this assumption that oh, somebody else has looked at this, and uh, it turns out that a lot of times nobody has looked at this, or very few people have looked at this. So you have end up with bugs like this that last like ten years, and ev everybody depends on this without realizing that these are there. What's more, they, they, they built up things on top of bugs, so they have to do all the evaluation process. So it's it's a it's a, a big headache. Oh yeah, I mean it's like essentially you're you're b building a house, but your your foundation is made out of sand because you you. You you have all these great security features that are going into Windows and Linux, but you're not actually building on something that's stable. And uh, th thankfully, like we we were able to kind of uh, highlight that this there's there's some problems here. So a lot more people got interested in uh, find, finding more issues. And there's been a a lot of improvement in this space, but there there's certainly a number of more bugs to find there. We we definitely haven't come to the end of. Uh, Finding bugs at Grub. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, Alex. Ubuntu uh, doing the intermediate signing. Were you curious about where it actually keeps the revocation for the intermediately signed certificates and whether or not you can actually change this? <laughs> so, so there there is some functionality that was added to the shim specifically to have vendor revocation lists. So that that is uh, added as well. Yeah, uh, I get this, but yeah. I'm, I'm curious with that yet additional revocation list. If you can change that list, which you know, unlike DBX, is probably editable. I, I believe it. I believe it's signed by the uh, the CA itself. So, so you, you you have you have the the root the the root CA from the vendor that is then verifying the the revocation list to make sure that that's not changed. I think. I, I could be completely wrong about that, but I think it was intended to be set up that way. It'd be interesting to investigate that because that that's yet another. I mean, it, it is a solution, but it's also introducing a couple new interesting vectors into this. Yeah, I mean, like we we've we're, we're basically adding new functionality that's not widely tested, and uh, if if it's based on this, if there are more bugs in revocation, then we're going to end up with uh, 
uh, eat, running out of space even more quickly. Like with the with the SBAT stuff, there there were uh, uh, an initial implementation of that pushed out. But if there are problems with that, that's where there there have been a few different proposed ways to try and uh, reduce the uh, the the need for having another 156 uh, shims revoked um, because with, with the with the initial boot hole revocation and uh, the previous ones uh, we we were basically getting to around half of the total space in a typical uh, in a typical desktop or uh, server Esse essentially we this is a BIOS uh, specific like the the platform specific size and uh, they they could potentially put out new uh, new versions of BIOS that increases that seat size but that's also something that hasn't been tested and like doing that kind of uh, migration from one format to another might be uh, problematic as well I mean we, we ran into that kind of a uh, NVRAM format issue with the uh, the Google Cloud uh, instances as well Okay, uh, we are taking questions from from the people, so so shoot please. Hi, Ceci, Miki. Hi. <laughs> um, do you know of any testing framework for bootloaders for hardening them for writing test cases or bringing? Uh, engineering practices uh, so so one, one, thing, so one, one thing that we did see was uh, people were figuring out how to uh, how to basically run uh, grub inside of a fuzzer so that that's something that like basically like an automated fuzzer in order to uh, actually get some coverage like one of the things that Mickey highlighted is like their their unit tests were really really lacking so that's one area that I think would be uh, have significant improvement if they if they did add some much more significant uh, unit tests, and then also uh, running fuzzing of all of the, all of these different interfaces on a regular basis, and uh, they, they, we did have the ability to essentially uh, run with some compilation options. You're you're able to build essentially a test version of Grub that you can then uh, run inside of uh, AFL or something like that, but it's a. Uh, it's not something that was being done initially. Uh, as as part of that code audit audit, um, we we did end up running, uh, basically putting, in addition to the manual code audit, uh, also running and and putting the entire Grub code base through Code Verity, so doing some kind of a, a static analysis of the code itself, and that that uncovered a lot of issues. Um, I th I think uh, kind of using both those types of operations where you're, you're improving uh, improving the test coverage to actually uh, uh, cover some of the known things that might be issues, doing fuzzing to detect new stuff that shows up that you aren't expecting, and then also just regularly throwing stuff into static analyzers and seeing what types of things you can you can come up with would be a good idea. And I know there's a, a few different additional uh, uh, open source uh, code analysis frameworks that might be uh, useful this year as well. I know there's like a, a code QL, uh, I think from GitHub is uh, is available free for use with uh, open source projects. And that's uh, another thing that could be uh, uh, used for this type of uh, kind of hunting for vulnerabilities and looking for uh, bugs in a, in a large open source projects. Did, did, did that uh, answer your question or make any sense? Yeah, yeah. I was also thinking about um, testing uh, on an emulator like KEMU or something like that, if I was wondering if that could be possible. Yeah, yeah. So I, I mentioned there's like, so running in the running it in the the normal environment where you have UEFI firmware loading it and running it and then it loads and runs uh, the operating system you can you can essentially emulate that by uh, 
uh, building a, a OVMF image in uh, from Tiano Core. Essentially, you can build a, a, a UEFI firmware image that's intended for virtualization, and then use that with Kimu in order to uh, test certain flows. That's going to be kind of cumbersome, though, and it's kind of a pain. Um, there's another way that you can build Grub that's that's more of a you're, you're essentially building it as an application that you can run in the in the under Linux, and then use that to do things like test the file parsers and uh, test some other functionality. That that isn't going to uh, be as useful for uh, uh, some of the hardware specific stuff, but you can also wrap some of those interfaces and point those at files and like if you're doing like something maybe like the the bsd file system parser you think there might be a bug there you could uh, wrap that and have it basically pointed at a file that you're you're manipulating and and do some automated fuzzing tests that way um, there is also a, a, a keyling framework that is a basic I think it's uh, built on top of Unicorn Engine, and you can at least do some some uh, emulation or fuzzing of UEFI executables. Uh, it would take a lot of work to get uh, to get a Grub to run under that, but that's another option. So I think there are some frameworks that you could do do some kind of automated testing with, but uh, uh, I think. That's happening to some extent, but not as much as I'd like. And I, I think there would be uh, good to do a lot more of that because I'm sure there's I'm sure there's more issues that will uh, fall out if we can get get more automated testing, uh, throwing stuff at it. Could you send later or somewhere in the chat the name of this uh, tool running on top of Unicorn Engine? Yeah, I can send that. I think it's like. Uh, K or Q I L I N G dash framework uh, keyling, but I, I can send the specific name. Uh, it's on uh, GitHub also. Okay, and my last question is: Do you know if um, the maintainers keep uh, the latest uh, version of Flex, for example, because Flex is known to have uh, to have had. Uh, some uh, vulnerabilities in the generated code. Th that's true. Um, I, I, I think generally they use the, uh, the the latest version that's in the the, the version of the software that they're uh, building uh, building the distro with. So if if it's like the latest Ubuntu or something, it would be, it'd be using the latest version of Flex. Uh, I I if it's like an old version of uh, like CentOS or uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux that's using like an old version of GCC, they might have older tool chain there as well, but it would generally be updated to the latest version within that distribution. So hopefully they would have uh, updated versions of Flex. I don't think they're building with a specific fixed version of Flex that's outside of the, uh, outside of the normal operating system update process. But yeah, I mean, def definitely, if you have bugs in uh, bugs in Flex that's generating generating code with bugs, that would uh, affect this as well. It, it's really important to uh, understand the dependencies that you have and and what they're doing. Uh, in this case, there was a essentially a mismatch in expectations between the uh, the people writing Flex expected this they, they expected certain behavior when they called this macro but the the people writing grub didn't realize the full ramifications of what what the flex code was doing with these uh, macro calls that it was doing so because because there was that mismatch of understanding what these two different pieces of code were doing is why why this uh, bug happened in the first place and that's a, a really common thing if you have if you have two complex software packages that have uh, complex dependencies between them, it's uh, really easy to run into this type of uh, issue. Okay. Uh, more questions, please.
We have 10 more minutes before releasing. Well, we have a little less than that. We have time for one more question. <laughs> so outside, okay, of, okay. outside of more unit testing, Jesse, what would you suggest we do? What other approaches can like Grub developers, Shim developers, et cetera, take to actually reduce the risk of running into these vulnerabilities? I mean, outside of unit testing. Well, I'd say make sure you have enough developers for the size of the code base. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's uh, true. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, if, if you have limited resources, uh, I, I do think like automating as much as you can is is really useful. I mean, just also ha having a better idea of what what bad coding patterns look like. Like we, we found that problem with uh, uh, multiplying variables together and using that immediately as a uh, as a allocation size without checking if there's an integer overflow. That was like a hugely per, uh, persistent thing throughout the, the code database. And I, I think having a better better idea of what types of things are dangerous in the first place uh, is, is going to give you some help. Um, there, there are some uh, um, code pattern uh, tools like uh, Coconel can be used for like uh, semantic matching through code bases. And uh, people have found a lot of bugs in the Linux kernel and other open source projects using uh, that tool. Essentially, you can write a, uh, a semantic pattern and then uh, match that pattern throughout the code base, even if uh, like variable names change or the syntax changes a little, a little bit. It can still be used to identify uh, risky code patterns. And I think that's a, that's a really great tool that that can find this type of thing if you can write good patterns for things that you know are uh, risky. OK, so we close here. Uh, I think, uh, Daniel, if you want to close as, as you're here, please. Yeah, OK. Um, well, uh, thanks, Jesse, Miki, for presenting for the eh, for this audience and for the Universidad Nacional de Córdoba. Eh, let's uh, keep in touch. Um, of course, I will <laughs> be in touch with you. Eh, <laughs> so we will provide more info later. For example, this, um, these tools and, this, um, and some more CVs uh, links. And thanks again. And let's uh, let's see if uh, some uh, students uh, would like to contribute by running uh, static analysis tools like Clang, Tidy, or things like that to the code base of Graph. Maybe you can yeah, find. Yeah, if if you guys can can find more bugs, I think that'd be great. Uh, but thanks yeah. for having us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank Bye -bye. you. See you. Bye.